This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Quick shout out to Bulbasaurus, a proto mammal named after Bulbasaur. There are actually quite a few cases like this, including a cancer gene very briefly named Pokemon before the Pokemon company threatened legal action. First, onto Kabuto. The Pokedexes seem to disagree as to whether the Pokemon is extinct or not, but that's what I've come to expect from the anime at this point. Seriously, it's often wrong. Kabuto is obviously based on trilobites and horseshoe crabs, a mix of the two. Their anatomy especially differs in one case. Four eyes. Kabuto has eyes under its shell, as everyone knows, but those little dots on top of its head are also eyes. This is totally not absurd, as some insects in real life have compound eyes as well as simple eyes, and the indents near where that second set of eyes are located are thought to actually be some sort of primitive ear, as trilobite eye size is inversely proportional to the size of those indents. This means Kabuto's evolution favored incredibly high perception, bringing up the question of why. In real life, Trilobites are heavily featured in fossil records around the time of the Cambrian explosion, an evolutionary event where an incredible amount of new species arose due to rapid evolution. Did this happen in the Pokemon world? Did Kabuto have many predators demanding this? Here we also have another case of metals and stones being incorporated into Pokemon biology being less absurd than in real life. Trilobites' eye lenses are made of calcite, a stone. Exceptionally pure calcite is totally clear, so it wouldn't hinder the eyesight of a trilobite at all. Fossil Pokemon bodies being stoned is more reasonable than that, in my opinion. Kabutops are based on trilobites, specifically this one. Kabutops seem to have adaptations made for hunting prey, by cutting them open and drinking the juices with the giant sides on their side. But Kabuto seem to have a relatively docile design. Kabutops, as opposed to Kabuto, is adapting for life on land. This is visible in its design, but the dex entries mention it as well. The presence of sides for its arms means that its adult stage is based more on predation than its larval stage, especially considering its main eyes are now the top eyes rather than the bottom eyes. It still says it's fast though, so maybe these legs are adapted to work like crabs helicopter legs, and they can live on land or in water. The question then remains, why did it begin to live on land? Did its prey move to land, or were there more threatening beasts in the ocean forcing it onto land? Was it enabled to outhunt something in the water? Kabutops is said to have gone extinct because it couldn't evolve to live on land in time. In time for what? Was the sea changing dramatically into something it couldn't handle? Something that drastic usually wipes out species before they can attempt to evolve around it, so it wouldn't have evolved legs in the first place. Was it getting outhunted in the water and it couldn't move quickly enough onto land before its food source was taken from it? On top of that, how would Kabuto still be alive but Kabutops are no longer around? How does that work? It's clear that Pokemon only metamorphose due to the pressures to which they're exposed. Are Kabuto really finding nothing to fight? Do they really have no natural predators in these few areas where they live? Aerodactyl are based on pterodactyls, which, like Aerodactyl, are heavily adapted to be aerial predators, so much so that they struggle to walk normally on the land. Aerodactyl very awkwardly has a beak-like structure on the top of its mouth with a toothed jaw. This is either some animal that's very awkwardly mid-evolution, in the grand scheme, not like Pokemon evolution, some very specific combination of jaw structures best suited to consume its prey, likely shelled, or it's a design blunder. I'm leading towards the middle option, as they keep this design in this mega form, which is said to be how the Pokemon is supposed to look, fragments of rock and all. This is a strange case though, as it loses its hands, and we see it as a non-mega in New Snap, unrevived. It also goes against people making restored fake bonds that lack rock typing. Speaking of though, those hands aren't seen in modern birds, so maybe they evolved out. Or this is a progenitor to Pokemon with four limbs and wings, like Charizard. This is unlikely to me, as it would require evolving another set of limbs rather than expanding on anything present. But the wings do look similar, and they are three-fingered, but that's hardly relevant. Look at hooves. The body shape matches overall as well, including the two horns atop their head. So who knows? Now, Ome Knight. There's not much to say, but apparently Archaeops preyed on Omenite. This means that it either lived in shallow waters, Archaeops lived on oceanside cliffs, or Archaeops, in all their terrible flying glory, flew over the ocean to the deeper parts where Omenite might near the surface to feed on plankton when sources further down are scarce. Now for Omestar. One thing you'll notice if you read the Pokedex entries is that it sometimes seems to consider the earlier fossil Pokemon as separate from their evolutions, namely when talking about extinction. That's just weird. Omestar are said to feed on shelter by wrapping the tentacles around them and cracking their shells open with their beaks. This tracks with how these animals and their descendants hunt in real life. It's said it died out due to its shell being too heavy. 
inhibiting prey capture, but that would just cause an animal to slowly lose the shell. In fact, when reading these dex entries, I thought to myself, well that happened in real life and it led to octopi. Did that happen in the Pokemon world leading to octillery? Well yes, Ultra Sun's entry does state that Omestar evolved into octillery. Also according to a couple entries, Omestar lived at the same time as Shelter. While none of Omestar's entries would raise any alarms about this, Omei Knight says that it lived in the primordial sea in an ancient sea long ago. No entries from Shelter deny this, but that does mean Shelter is incredibly ancient and a stagnant species without adaptation. That makes sense considering how claims breed in real life. Lilip and Cradily are based on crinoids, or sea lilies. But crinoids in real life, as far as we know, didn't eat fish, but that may be due to their smaller size. Lilip disguising as a flower specifically to attract prey does mean that there's some sort of oceanic flower-like organism, but many entries say seaweed, so this may just be an error. However, Cradily's entries state that it does hunt on land, so maybe Lilip does something similar? In the water though, it sticks to rock with its suckers, so it lives somewhere with intense currents. It's plant-like, but it's not a plant. Cradily are possibly not extinct according to Emerald's text entries, but this could just be me misinterpreting something. Most of his entries are present tense rather than past tense, but Lilip's entries definitively say that it is extinct. The Pokedex entries are normally kinda fine about this, unless you got the anime, but the fossil Pokemon seem to be all over the place. Cradily has this hood that covers most of its face. Could its more mobile hunting style leave it more vulnerable to being spotted by potential predators? Perhaps it's to protect its face from attacks when it's digesting bigger, more dangerous prey. Cradily, to hunt, extend their neck up to three times its normal length to grab prey. They then wrap their tentacles around them and digest them in place. While this may seem more plant than animal, venom is theorized to have initially been digestive enzymes present in spit that eventually evolved into its own concoction. This also makes using the moves acid or gastroacid far more disgusting. Anorith is obviously based heavily on Anomalocaris, who happens to be an apex predator of its time, and if I recall correctly, this is the reason that fish evolved a very special adaptation I'll be talking about with Relicant. Continuing with predation, Anorith has many similar design elements to Yanmega, who is also an apex predator. Did they share an ancestor, or is Anorith itself Yanmega's ancestor? Anorith's eyes on the side of its head, rather than the top, give it a much wider field of view than Anomalocaris, enabling it to be a much better predator, as it can see what it's hunting and eating. Fire Red and Leaf Green's entry raises a huge question. It is a kind of Pokemon progenitor. Fish did not evolve from Anomalocaris in real life, so is it specifically talking about bugs? Many also refer to it as a Pokemon ancestor, or an ancestral Pokemon, and even say it's the ancestor of bug Pokemon, which doesn't exactly track in real life, as we know. This divergence from real-life evolution trees is fine for sure, but it does make my future work quite the trial. Finally, Ultra Sun's entry states that Anorith don't live due to the ocean's composition changing once upon a time. Could this be what killed off Kabutops? Armaldo's claws being so powerful reinforces that fossil Pokemon may have always been rocky or rock type, as this power would need use in order for the Pokemon to evolve it. Anything more is a waste of energy. Armaldo seems to contribute the trend of having entirely different ecology from its predecessor, having lived in land rather than the ocean. This is evidenced by its legs, but the entries state this as well. However, it retains the paddle-like feathery structures that Anorith possessed, and it uses them for swimming. So it's possible that the larval stage of this evolution spends its time in the water while the adults prowl on land, similar to frogs and many insect species. In fact, it's stated to hunt in the water, but live on land. Was it omnivorous and it found plenty of uncontested food on land but still required seafood? Did it live on land to avoid predators in the ocean? It had a hard shell, so it had some predator hunting it down. If this predator was exclusively water-based, then surely there would be population issues with a vulnerable nymph stage. Evolution most often favors children's survival over adult survival. Now it's time for Relicant, one of my favorite fossil Pokemon due to its real-life inspiration. Its body is covered in tough, stone-like scales. This vaguely matches with the Coelacanth and other inspirations for Relicanth, except those have protections only on the head, while Relicanth does have more. The gigantic, powerful jaw did serve the same purpose as Relicanth's scales. It's possible that Relicanth used this for this as well, considering they may be the reason Cradily has that covering over its head. Relicanth walking on the sea floor is a nice reference to its real-life inspiration, evolving to walk on land, paving the way for the first land vertebrates. It not evolving is strange, though. 
No life form is really perfect, as predators and prey, parasites, and diseases are always threatening an organism's survival. Maybe it's simply difficult to hunt, and since it only eats microscopic organisms, it has little reason to adapt. Cranidos is a jungle-dwelling Pokemon based on a Pachycephalosaurus that breaks trees in its way. These snap trees also help it to reach fruits in the canopy. I can't imagine these trees were too big or too tall, as they wouldn't have much time to grow with Cranidos eating them all the time. The Dex also states that it downed prey with headbutts, implying that it's an omnivore. Did it also knock trees down to get prey from higher branches, or maybe just use the area as a hunting zone? The Pokemon is stated to be dumb, which is awful rude and just an assumption based on its thick skull leaving little room for a brain. This fossil is described as like an iron ball, indicating that we have yet another case of iron being incorporated into Pokemon biology. Weird that I keep running into this. It's stated to attack Aerodactyl with headbutts, but it's strange that Aerodactyl would hunt in a jungle, considering it needs a clear area to fly effectively, though Cranidos has that covered. Its head is covered in thorns, which may actually be used to prevent predators like Aerodactyl, should the next entry be telling the truth, from grabbing it easily and taking it away. Rampardos' back seems to be arched downward in a permanent headbutt pose. This softly suggests against my previous theory about them knocking prey from branches, as it'd be hard for them to look up for long periods of time. However, Pearl's entry contributes to the theory that it bashes trees down to make hunting territory. The Dex claims that the brain never gets to grow due to repeated bashing. This is likely true because a, a lot of fluid is needed to cushion the brain against the heavy blows the Pokemon is delivering, so there will be very little space left in its foot-thick skull. b, a smaller brain requires less energy, meaning it can put more energy towards growing its muscles and fighting opponents. Rampardos' body, like Cranidos, also has a number of thorns covering it, and in some unusual places. What other fossil Pokemon were attacking Cranidos? And was this defense against Archaeops? According to Ultra Sun's entry, at some point, people were living close enough together with these Pokemon to have access to their remains for use as armor. It's incredibly unlikely, but it's not impossible. Ultra Moon claims that its stupidity led to its extinction. This is also unlikely and also not impossible. Extant animals always have the time to adapt as needed, but it's possible that its prey was outsmarting it and its biology was too hostile for the ability to grow a larger brain to compete. Lastly, why does Rampardos have tiny arms? There's no definitive answer for why T-Rex had tiny arms, but the running hypothesis is that it reduced accidental biting during group feeding. Rampardos' mouth does not look particularly threatening to me though. Maybe it gets in the way when charging. I theorize that Shieldon may be an ancestor Pokemon to Aeron. Both have similar facial structures with an iron defense. In real life, the younger something is, the more it resembles its ancestors. Fetuses of mammals look a lot like newts. They even have gills. This theory is weak, but it is there. Shieldon has a single metal claw on each foot. Does it use this to dig around for roots? It lives in the jungle, which often have clay soil, so the soil would be tougher to dig and also iron-rich. While the next entry states this Pokemon is rarely predated, only its face is ever found, so it does seem that the face just helps against predation. Bastiodon form a wall around their babies with their faces to protect them, which is a pretty common herd tactic across a lot of animals even today. We see Bastiodon have armor developed on the rest of their body as well, reinforcing my previous point that they're predated perfectly well from behind. Bastiodon have a massive jaw, meaning it probably eats some pretty hard food. Could this be downed trees from the Lampardo's rampage? Bastiodon's face has eye-like patterns on it, which are often used in real life to scare off massive predators. Who that might be is tough to say, but Rampardos and Tyrantrum have entries specifically mentioning their ability to punch through steel. However, Bastidon's entries mention that its armory is impenetrable. However, however, it also says that it fights with Rampardos, so it may be that Rampardos weakens it with repeated attacks then goes for softer spots. Tortuga is said to dive deep in the sea to depths of half a mile, but that's nowhere close to the average depths of the oceans. The Pokedex also states that they go on land to hunt, which is unrealistic. Leatherback sea turtles are very slow on land, and it wouldn't be able to outrun anything. About half of the entries state this though, so I guess I have to figure it out. <coughs> My guess is that it's eating eggs of either other turtles or some beach dwelling creature to get calcium for its shell. It's also possible that its tongue is like an alligator snapping turtles, being worm-like to lure and prey like crabs or birds. It's also possible that it hunts on land out of necessity, with bigger, stronger predators living in the oceans that would hunt and kill it easily. Caracosta has shell-like formations on its face. This could be to protect it from returning attacks, or it could enable it to chomp through tougher prey, reinforcing the snapping turtle relations I posited earlier. Black and White 2's entry does reinforce this. Sun's entry softly supports my Tortuga theory, stating that their shells aren't hard until they metamorphose into Caracosta, so it might be that they're pursuing prey out of danger until their shells fully harden. Most turtle predation in real life does happen when the turtles are young and their shells aren't fully developed, so this does have precedent. Ultrasun's entry implies that it lived around the same time as Omenite and Omastar. 
If this is the case, then it gives us a weird time frame for Omi Knight's existence. Arkin seems to be one of the precursors to flight in the Pokemon world. It's only capable of gliding, which was the precursor to flight in flying species like bats. What's interesting is that Arkin lacks any back claws for perching. This shouldn't be the case, as it hops along branches and would need back claws for gripping. This is a common theme in so many bird Pokemon though, I covered it in this video. It also has a pretty lacking tail, which again doesn't track with needing to balance on branches. Lacking it helps with gliding though, so that is a plus for consistent design. Ultrasound does confirm that Arkin may not be the only ancestor of bird Pokemon in the Pokemon world. This means that there may be other bird Pokemon fossils in the Pokemon world about which we don't know yet. Archaeops apparently need to run for two and a half miles before they're able to take flight. In fact, the Wikipedia list of longest runways doesn't even include runways below this length, so this entry is simply ridiculous. For the record, that's six minutes of this Pokemon running at its top speed just to start flying. Good news for it though, it hunts on the ground in packs, only swooping for the prey, which does help clear up how it would hunt Ome Knight with such limited flying. They likely swoop for them. The Dex also says they're cooperative and intelligent, but it doesn't explain how or if any tactics are used to justify this claim, other than surrounding, which doesn't take much intelligence to figure out. As for the last real fossil Pokemon, there is such little information on them. Amora and Aurorus lived in cold areas free from predators 100 million years ago, but the rest of the entries talk about their wizardliness. Aurorus is said to have negative 240 degree Fahrenheit crystals covering its body, which is cold enough to freeze xenon gas. And Tyrant is a toddler that throws tantrums and accidentally hurts things, and Tyrantrum is able to bite through almost anything. Both were around 100 million years ago. One interesting note is that it's theorized it's supposed to be covered in feathers, but when we see one alive and well in New Snap, it's clear of any feathers. Finally, and please stick around, this one's funny. The Galar Fossils. The Galar Fossils are four organisms, two fronts and two backs, that are plastered together by Dr. Careless. <coughs> Careless. Drake Azult looks to be the most normal of them, but is of course not quite correct. Arctozolt comes up next, using fins as feet. Dracovish is in second place for inaccuracy, with a head being placed on the tail. And Arctovish is in first place. Why are its eyes sideways? Why does its mouth look like that? They aren't slanted, and that's not its mouth. The head is upside down. Upside down! I can't even piece together any information about the original fossil Pokemon from the Pokedex entries. These just are wildly incorrect. 